I'm Anne, and this is Bible Study Hub, and I'm so happy to have you tonight. If this is your first time or you're brand new to this, an extra special welcome to you. We're going to be in the book of Colossians. I believe this is our fifth week in this book. So we have gotten through the first two chapters and just a little bit into chapter three tonight. I am hoping and planning to actually go all the way through chapter three, and then we'll pick it up in chapter four, hopefully next week. We'll see if I can do it. Um, so last week we talked about how, how we are to keep our eyes up on things that are above and not on the things of this earth and that that is kind of the recipe to have a, a happy life and a good attitude and just to keep everything kind of in alignment with where God wants it. He also said that our lives are hidden with Christ in God. And we just talked about last week what that meant, that, that Christ hides us covers us from the wrath of God so that we never have to face that wrath. And that was a really great uh, thing to walk away with. And then, um, oh, and then we said Jesus isn't first in our lives. He is our lives. And so we kind of walked away with three really big concepts this past week. And I hope it was helpful for you. And I hope that you were able to retain some of that just as you went about your daily life and that it made a difference. But tonight, we have a lot to get through, so I'm going to hop right into verse 5, Colossians 3. You can turn there in your Bible. I also will be popping the verses up here if you want to just follow along, or you can just listen however is best for you. So let's get going here in Colossians 3, and this is a bit of a chunk, but we're going to do verses 5 to 10. So it says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you? In you. And then he goes through this list, sexual immorality, impurity, passion evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Yes, God will deal with sin. That is what he does. So all of those things just mentioned, God's wrath will be poured out on those things unless it's already been poured out on them because Jesus took those on himself on the cross on our behalf. Um, verse seven says, in these two, you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. And then if you thought you were safe in the first list, like, whew, none of those apply. <laughs> well, I don't know if any of us get out of this one alive. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. And then he goes on to say, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So this is what this passage is talking about. There should be a definite difference between BC, life before Christ, and AC, life after Christ. So before Christ, we are some combination of those things and probably some that are not even listed. This is not an exhaustive list. It's just a list that kind of helps us go, ooh, ooh, ouch, ooh, yeah. Those are things that we are delivered from when Christ comes into our life. It may take some time of walking with him. That's what we call sanctification, big word, just means being made more like Christ after salvation, before heaven. So it's like this earthly time after salvation, before we get to heaven, that's sanctification. That's where God is working on us and purging out the things that shouldn't be there and helping us with the things that should be there. So he says, you know, it's kind of a picture of like, take off that, oh, that nasty old self and all those things that it involved, put on the new self. That's Jesus Christ. Remember we said your life is hidden with Christ and God. He's covering you. He is your cover. Put on Christ. And that should, bottom line, uh, keep us as Christians from walking in unrepentant sin, which is something that real Christians should never, ever do. Then he goes on to say something really, really interesting. You're going to like this. Verse 11, he says, here in the body of Christ in the church, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. So I'm going to actually leave that verse up there while we kind of go through this, because this doesn't necessarily apply directly to us in our own present church situations, these categories, but it's extremely relevant in applying to us in our churches in other categories. And I don't even need to tell you what these are. As we go through these, what you're going to find is that you're going to be able to go, oh, I can think of categories present in my church. And I don't want there to be factions between those. He doesn't have to name them. 
we just kind of inherently know what they are. But back in Paul's day in the church at Colossae, this is what they would have had all under one roof, all worshiping together, all studying the word of God together. They had Greek and Jew. Now, if you've been with us for very long, if you were with us in the book of Luke and in the book of Acts, then you know right away, like bells are going off, like, oh, yes, the Gentiles or Greeks and the Jews did not like each other. I'm not talking about in the church at Colossae, I mean, like in general. You remember how Gentiles, we said in the book of Luke, when they would come, I'm sorry, Jews, when they would come out of Gentile territory, would take their sandals off and knock the dust off of their sandals because they didn't want to contaminate Israel with Gentile dust. That's how much they hated the Gentiles. When they had to go somewhere, if they could go around a Gentile area, they would go around it. Even if going through it were a little faster, they didn't want to contaminate themselves. They wouldn't talk to them, eat with them, nothing. The, Jew, uh, the, the Gentiles, on the other hand, despised the Jews at least as much, if not more. In fact, they wanted to kill them most of the time. So here we have this group of people that traditionally did not get along, did not associate with each other. And here they are, brothers and sisters now in Christ, at church, together, worshiping the same God, saved in the same exact way through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's amazing. He's saying, there is no Jew and Greek anymore. You are one in Christ. And then he kind of goes on and it almost sounds like a repeat where he says circumcised and uncircumcised. And, and you might be saying, well, isn't that the same thing? Honestly, it's like Jew and Gentile or Jew and Greek. Um, yes, but it's a little bit more than that because some of the Gentiles, when they came to Christ, would get circumcised. They didn't have to. In fact, Paul says, you really don't need to do that. But some of them had done that. They had made that decision for whatever reason, they wanted to go ahead and make that commitment. So then you had among the Gentiles, the circumcised Gentiles and the uncircumcised Gentiles. And so they would possibly be kind of at odds with each other. You know, you didn't do it right. No, you didn't need to do that. So, so you've got those two groups. And then we've got barbarians. Like what are barbarians? The, the term barbarian was a term that the Greeks used to describe anybody who did not speak Greek fluently. They really felt like Greek was the best language ever known to mankind. And if you didn't speak it to them, it sounded like bar, 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 bar. That was what your language to them sounded like. So, so the word barbarian actually is one of those words that kind of like sounds like it is. It's onomatopoeia. There's a big word for you, like click and buzz. They sound like what they are, bar, 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 barbarian. So that's what they called it. So it was really kind of a, a prideful, arrogant thing. So, so he's saying... Yeah, um, there's no barbarians. In other words, I don't want you looking down on people in your congregation who don't speak Greek as their first language. Um, he also goes on to say Scythian. Now, what is, who's that? <laughs> That's worse than barbarians. Okay, these guys were known for being the worst people on the planet. They have been recorded in history as being ones who lived in wagons, um, would flay and scalp their enemies and then drink their blood out of their enemies' skulls. These are things that they just did for fun. That's this group of people. What this tells me is that those people are in this church, which means these people who are total barbarians, like real ones, they got saved. And they are now worshiping with their brothers and sisters who have embraced them, come on into the body of Christ. I mean, this is not for the faint hearted. We could have an absolute mess here. And then if that weren't bad enough to have that many factions and groups of people under one roof, you've got slaves and you've got free people. How are slaves typically treated by the free people? Well, not at the same level as the other free people, right? No, Paul's saying, no, 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 no. Under the roof of the, the bonds of Christ in, in your church setting and the body of Christ, not just at church, but, you know, the church universal, you guys are all on equal footing at, at the foot of the cross. I, I, I don't want to hear about Greeks and Jews and circumcised and not circumcised and barbarians and Scythians and slaves and free. I don't want to hear about any of that stuff because you are all brothers and sisters now in Christ and you need to treat each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. That is incredible. And like I said, when I started that, we 
probably don't have Scythians as part of our church. I don't know about you, but thank God there are no slaves in my church um, and free people looking down on them. I don't have that type of thing. But I want you to think about in your church setting, who do you have? Is there a group of people who maybe is marginalized? Maybe they don't, nobody intends to marginalize them, but perhaps they kind of feel that way anyway. Do you have different classes of people in your church? The Bible is so, so solid on this that no, in the body of Christ, no, never. We never, ever treat each other differently because of our background, our heritage, our race, our language, what our, our socioeconomic status. Never. It's all honor. It's all grace. It's all love in the body of Christ. So that's what he's saying. Um, so then we go to the following section. And this is so sweet. When I read this, I have to smile because here's how I feel. I feel like Paul is like a kid in a candy shop. Like he's writing along things that he wants for them. He's kind of told them a lot of stuff like, don't do this. Now he's going to say, here's what I do want you to do. And it's almost like as he's writing, he's like, okay, that's it. Oh, wait, I forgot. There's one more thing. Oh, yeah, I've got to write that down. He writes that down. Oh, wait, there's more. And he writes something else down. Oh, I forgot to say this. And he writes this down. So I don't know if that's the case or not. But as I read this, I just kind of get that sense that he's like, oh, I just got one more thing, just one more thing. So here's what he wants for us as a body of believers. And verses 12 to 17, Colossians 3. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. What he's saying here is, if you have love, I almost don't have to tell you all this other stuff. It's just going to be automatic. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you indeed were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And, as if that's not enough, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We talked about that verse a little bit last week, so we're not going to go into it too much now. But that's what Paul wants for us. That's kind of a daunting list, to be perfectly honest with you. But it's nice to know that what God doesn't want for the church is all those factions, everybody doing their own thing, everybody pointing fingers at everybody else. What he does want is love to cover all of it, that we're in the word together, that we're singing together psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, that we're forgiving one another. He doesn't say, now don't ever have a complaint against one another, because he knows that's just not possible. It's just, we're sinners, we're going to rub each other the wrong way. He says, if you do, forgive that person. And don't forget, uh, Christ forgave you. So you have to forgive other people because he forgave a whole lot more than you'll ever be asked to forgive. Well, that was enough to kind of be daunting. But we're not done because now Paul is going to get really personal. In fact, he's going to get right into the walls of our house and he's going to start talking to us as family units, not just as a church anymore, but now the family unit itself. So buckle your seatbelts. Here we go. Colossians 3, 18 to 21. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Now, in the Garden of Eden, back in the book of Genesis, which is where we're going, by the way, when we're done with Colossians, we're going to do the book of Genesis, and I cannot wait to do that. But in the book of Genesis, God gives Adam and or Eve a number of commands before the fall of man. So before they sinned, he has a few things that he tells them that they need to do. And I'm just going to pose this to you as a group. Go ahead and start commenting. Can you remember what any of those things would have been? Remember, this is before they sin. God had several things that he told Adam or Eve or both of them that he wanted them to do. 
What were some of those things? Can you remember any of them? I'm looking at your comments here, excuse me. Um, yeah, back to that whole, you know, just people in the church, Emily said that had to be such radical thinking. It was, Emily, that was well put. It was extremely radical, like nobody else had ever conceived of such a thing, nor could they pull it off without the help of the Holy Spirit, because it's just not human nature to do that. All right, so the question that I'm waiting for answers on, see if you remember, if you've ever um, read the book of Genesis, um, Whoops, sorry, Roberta. Roberta says, attend the garden and be fruitful and multiply. Very good. Tend to the garden and be fruitful have, and multiply, have babies. Um, yep, Susie too. She says, take care of his creation. Absolutely. Um, Bob <laughs> hits the big one. Don't eat that fruit. There's one tree I don't want you eating off of and that's it. Don't do that. Very good, you guys. There's only one I can think of that nobody has hit on yet. I'll give it just another second in case you do. Rack your brains. There's one more. There's one more. It's kind of a, I don't know. It's not one of the bigger ones, I suppose, but it's kind of a fun one. Okay. Susie says, and to commune with God. Yep. He definitely walked in and talked. All right. Here. Whoops. Sorry. They jump up as I'm clicking on them. Name the animals. That's the one I was thinking. Yes, and have children and take care of the garden. Um, very good. And um, and Mary says to choose him. Okay, great. All really, really good. I, I'm interested to know that not a single one of you said that God said to Eve, I want you to submit to Adam. And nobody said, boy, I just remember Adam being told to love his wife and not treat her harshly. Oh, and I don't remember anybody saying, oh, and then God said, you know, when you do have children, just make sure that they're obedient. <laughs> he didn't say any of those things to them. Why not? Because they were perfect. He didn't have to. All that stuff that he told them to do, it was just sort of like icing on the cake stuff. Like here's a beautiful garden. It's already perfect. Have fun in it. Take care of it. There's no weeds. <laughs> Go pick the flowers. I don't know what they did. Go plant more stuff. You'll never have a locust hit it. Um, you know, enjoy all the fruit of the garden. Just don't eat that one. Those types of commands. This is a completely different set of commands now. And the reason that God is giving these here through Paul in Colossians is because we are so sinful as human beings that we have the propensity to utterly obliterate the graces of God in our lives. Family is a grace of God. Did you know that? I know some of you are saying, I, technically I do, but I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around that one. That's because we're all such sinners, right? Because we can blow these things up. And so what he's saying here is if you want to have the best possible situation in Christ, this is what this looks like. And I have to say, I've, I've often heard people, they will pull the verses that we just read apart. They will capitalize on wives. You have to submit to your husbands. Right here in scripture, it says that either the Bible's true or it's not. So that's what you have. And then they stop. Or husbands, you have to love your wives. You don't love them enough. You've got to do better at that. But but they never address the that the wives need to be submitting at the same time. And then the children can really blow a house up if they're out of control. So here's the thing. If all those components are all working like God just said in the, in the word here in instruction, you have an absolutely beautiful grace of God situation and a beautiful home. If one of those elements is off, it crumbles the whole thing. So for instance, this is where we get the what if questions, you know, but what if as a wife, you know, blah, blah, blah. If the husband does not treat his wife with love and dignity and honor and care and protection, it is so hard for her to submit to him. Because half the stuff that he might be wanting her to submit to isn't even godly stuff. Now she's in a quandary and she doesn't know what to do. Flip that around. There are husbands who truly love their wives and their wives do not respect them. And they will not follow them for anything. Even if it's a great idea, he wants to do it. She puts her foot down and says, absolutely not. And so it destroys him and it destroys their relationship. And then again, you know, the kids can be blowing things up if they're being completely out of control and disobedient, then mom and dad are fighting about it and everybody, and it's a mess. So in order for all of these things to work, they all have to be in place. Now, um, Peter actually has some, some interesting, let's see if I can find it. <laughs> I've got so many notes up here. 
yeah, some interesting kind of like parallel stuff to go along with this. So I, I actually want to pull up what he says, and then we're going to talk about this. Um, he says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, meaning they're not saved, they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives. I don't know why that's kind of making me get choked up here. When they see respectful and pure conduct. Okay, I do know why I'm getting choked up. I will tell you why I didn't expect to cry over that tonight. Because I know women that that's happened to them. Not all, it's not a promise. It's not a promise. But I know women personally, it's taken a long time who got saved and their husband wasn't saved. And they knew this verse and they said, I will do that. And it so changed the way that they related to their husband that eventually their husband came around and said, what you have, I want too. It so changed your life. I want that. And it wasn't because she was beating him over the head with a Bible and badgering him to go to church every week. It was because she loved him and she respected him. And when he wanted to make a decision, as long as that wasn't outside of the biblical bounds and it wasn't a foolish one, even if it wasn't what she really wanted to do, she would go with that out of respect for him. That is how powerful this thing is. Submission is to entrust yourself. Men, please hear this. When we as wives submit to you, we are entrusting ourselves in a very vulnerable way to you, to your decision. We do it out of our own volition because we love the Lord and we love you, but it is a little scary sometimes for us to do it because we are relinquishing control. And honestly, us women are control freaks. So if we do that, please accept that as love from us because it's not something that we do easily. Well, let's talk about the husbands for a second now that we've talked about the wives. It, back to Colossians, verse 19 says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Remember that in this time period, wives, women in general, had no basic rights. They were considered property. Um, they were not able to, to really operate in, in society in any sort of um, meaningful business sense or, or be even a, um, a witness in a court setting. Uh, they, they couldn't initiate a divorce, but they could be divorced for any reason. So they were really treated very, very badly. So this is kind of, again, like Emily said earlier about stuff in the church, this is wow kind of thinking like, are you serious? This is, this is amazing. This is not normal uh, for this time period. And I don't think it's normal for any of us if we don't have Christ. But Peter, again, deals with the husbands in a way that sheds even more light on it. So we're just going to be back and forth a little bit between Colossians and 1 Peter 3 tonight, but I can't stop. I have to read this to you. So Peter says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Yes, that means what it says. If a man does not love his wife and is not treating her the way that God wants him to treat her, God says, I'm not listening to your prayers. Guy. Ooh. Okay, so again, women, good to know so we can encourage and help our husbands as they do live the Christian life to be that godly, not by banging them over the head with our Bibles and dragging them to church, but just in the way that we interact with them. But let's go back to this whole weaker vessel thing, because that doesn't sound uh, necessarily like something that we go, oh, good. Yes, I want to be a weaker vessel. Um, this does not mean that women are weak or that they're supposed to act weak. If you've ever read Proverbs 31, it's like for those of us who know that chapter, the minute I hear Proverbs 31, I'm like, oh yeah, that one, I never live up to it. <laughs> You'll have to read it if you're not familiar with it. It's this, it's this husband describing his wife in the most glowing, amazing way, all the things that she is and all the things that she does. And it's like all of our desire to be that woman, but we all know we never will be probably because it's just about impossible. But that woman in Proverbs 31 that's described is a strong woman. I mean, she considers a field and she buys it. You know, I do that with shoes, but I don't think it's the same thing. So she is a strong woman. She makes good decisions for herself when she needs to. So you don't have that and then how, oh, but they're also weak here. That doesn't even make any sense. Weak, weaker vessel 
is actually a term that they're referring to pottery. So, so here's, it, let me give you a little visual illustration of what they're trying to say in, to, in 2022, okay? Because I don't have pottery. This is a mixing bowl. You probably can see that. It used to be my grandma's. I got it um, when she passed away. I got, I got my grandma's mixing bowl. And I, I know it sounds like a very odd thing to inherit, but I, it's really special to me. It's really, really special to me. And I love this mixing bowl and I have used it a million times, but I'll tell you what I'm not <laughs> is careful with it. I'm not careful. I think I've dropped this thing on the floor a whole pile of times. It doesn't dent. I mean, it's a good old one, you know? This was made a long, long time ago before metal dented all the time. So you can't destroy it. Um, I whisk stuff in. I'm not worried about scratching it. I throw it in the dishwasher. I stick it in the freezer. I probably put it in the oven if I wanted to. I don't worry because this bowl is going nowhere. This is a great bowl and I love it. But it's not a weaker vessel. The finer a vessel is, the weaker it is. Exhibit two. This, my friends, is a Waterford crystal goblet. I got this as a wedding gift 27 plus a few months years ago. 27 years ago. I have used these, I'm not joking, this is terrible, three times in 27 years because I am so afraid, like I'm sitting here right now thinking, what are the chances I'm going to break it right now? I am so afraid I'm going to break or crack these goblets. The second time I used these, I was carefully washing them after our company left. And I was going around the rim with a washcloth and it cracked. I, to this moment, I don't, I have no idea how that happened. I don't even know. I mean, it, yeah, it's pretty fine, but I wasn't squeezing it or anything and I cracked it. I had to get a new one. I think that's why I only ever used them one other time after that. I'm afraid to wash them now. Anyway, all that to say, men, this is not your wife, okay? This is not her. This is your wife. Treat her like you would treat a beautiful crystal goblet that you love, that you cherish, that you take care of. You don't want to shatter it. You don't want to break it. You treat it that way, not because it's not worth much, because it is worth so much more. Which one do you think cost more? Of course, the goblet. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> You're like, put the things down. We've seen enough of that. But seriously, that's what it's talking about to the men when it says your wife is the weaker vessel. And that's what Paul is saying when he says, don't be harsh with her. Pop this up. Don't be harsh with your wife, men. You'll shatter your wife. God made her sensitive. He made her that way. This is so your children will survive childhood. You know, that's why you have a mom and a dad, because the mom has to be there to hug them when they fall down. And the dad has to be there to say, brush it off. You, you're good. Keep going. Like there's this great balance that God has created in the family unit. And honestly, after talking about the submission thing with the wives, how many of us wives would say, hands up, I would gladly submit to any man who treats me, any, you know, my husband, obviously, who treats me like that fine Waterford crystal goblet with such care and love and honor and protection because he loves me so much. He doesn't want me to ever be hurt. And anything he can do to protect me in the most loving, not overbearing, but just loving, kind way, um, that will sign up to submit to that any day of the week. So again, it goes in circles. Both components have to be in play in order for this to work. Then it goes on to the children. Children, obey your parents in everything. Do you notice something here? It does not say, parents, make sure your children obey you because that's right. It addresses the children directly which means the children are in the service listening to this letter being read. They're listening to the word of God. Children can understand the Bible and they absolutely do need to be read and taught the word of God. That is so important. Don't ever think, I don't care how young they are, start reading them that, you know, they have a little children's Bible. So it's in words that they can understand better. Start reading that to them from the youngest of age. Teach them the Bible stories. Teach them the Bible. They can understand it. And these are verses that they need to know from a young age. God told you that you are to obey. This is important to God. And it's important to us and our family. And then it just goes on to basically say, you know, 
um, dads, don't be too hard on your children. You'll exasperate them and then they'll just give up. And that's not good either. All of this, again, just like the church thing, is only possible. This is my dollar store goblet. I thought you'd like to know that because <laughs> I don't care if I break that one. I'm not breaking the Waterford one. Anyway, all that to say, all of this is only possible in Christ. It is not possible outside of him in any way. But now we go on to verse 22. I'm going to go over to the comments really quick and just see. Mm. This is okay. I've got to read some of these. They're in a different um, column, so if I'm teaching, I'm not seeing them. But um, I, let me just read some of your comments here because they're really good. Shirley says, I heard somewhere that the man is to return the woman back to God better, not tearing her down. So almost like he's presenting her to God and saying, here's what I did with what you, what you gave with, to me. I, I tried to return her even better than I, than I got her. I think that's very, very sweet. Um, Sandy says, actions always speak louder than words, which is absolutely true. In reference, I know that that was to um, how the woman, without even a word being said, can win her husband over simply by her conduct in the home. Um, Mary says, I have my mom's yellow corningware mixing bowl means the world to me. Yeah, some of those old pieces are just so very special, like my mixing bowl. Um, Emily says, she always felt safety in being submissive to her husband. She says, I am understanding this so much better now. Yes. A beautiful testimony to a marriage that's working the way that God wants it to work. Alan says, if a husband loves his wife as Christ loves the church, submission is not an issue for her. Amen. Amen. Especially if she also loves Jesus, um, then it's we're, we're all headed in the same direction, right? Right towards the cross. It's absolutely beautiful. Well, let's go on to verse 22. If you had to buckle your seatbelt for the last one, buckle it again, like get the shoulder harness on. Bond servants, obey everything, those who are your earthly masters. Oh, sorry, obey in everything, those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. That word bond servants, I'm just going to kind of blow this up a little bit here. It's the Greek word doulos, and it does not mean servant. It means slave. It always means slave. It's a slave. The translators know. <laughs> If they write bond slaves, <laughs> obey everything, um, they're going to have people just blowing up left and right because they don't understand it. So to calm it down, they translate it servants. I would prefer they just give us the actual word and let us wrestle with us because here's my question. And um, I'm not asking you to answer this. This is rhetorical. But the question that I immediately have, and, and you probably did too, is why didn't Paul just say, hey, Christians, don't have slaves. <laughs> hey, Christians, if you have slaves, let your slaves go. Why didn't he just say that? And to make matters worse, First Peter, again, I told you we're going to be back and forth. Chapter two this time, verse 18 says, servants, be, this is slave, again, it's doulos, slaves, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Okay, so this can pose some serious questions in our minds. Why didn't God just, I mean, he just gave us this huge list of things that we used to do that we no longer do. It doesn't seem like it would be that hard to add this to it. So there must be a reason. So I came up with three basic options that I have seen people basically um, go to, to try to harmonize or solve the slavery issue in the Bible like this. And one of those things is um, it, if God regulates uh, slavery instead of abolishes it, then he is not a good God. And he is morally inferior to where we are today because we have evolved into the state of moral superiority. And then we by, de you know, kind of default, make ourselves God and dethrone him because we know more than he does. That's, a, that's pretty out there. You don't hear people say that too much, but there are places where it is definitely going in that direction, or at least Jesus is indicted with that. Um, another possibility is, well, God didn't actually condone any of this, and, and this was not of him. Paul was writing on his own at this point. He wasn't being inspired by the Holy Spirit. He got this wrong, um, or he just wasn't evolved enough to kind of realize that, you know, we're all learning. Paul hadn't learned enough yet. So we know that that's not correct and it's not true. We've come a lot further. You hear that a lot more. Uh, if that is the case, 
then I don't know why we're wasting our time studying the Bible as it is, because now how do we know what's actually inspired and true and what is false? If, if one piece of it is false, how much more of it is false? Which pieces of it are false? It's either all true or please go do something more fun than this and just forget it. Go live your life. Have a great time because there is nothing more. Or the third thing is there is something that we are missing that if we knew it, this would make a lot more sense to us. I vote for number three. That's normally the way it goes. And I'm going to tell you that is exactly what's going on here. And we're going to figure out what that is tonight. And when we're done with this, you're going to feel much better about this passage and others that have to do with slavery. So there are different types of slavery that have existed throughout the course of time. You have Old Testament slavery, and we'll talk more about this when we do get to the book of Genesis. But just really briefly, God does regulate slavery in the Old Testament. To regulate something does not necessarily mean you condone it. He also regulates divorce in the New Testament, and he hates divorce, according to the book of Malachi. So he does allow for certain things because of the hardness of our hearts and the fact that we mess everything up. That is not his first choice. but he will allow it for a time because that is how society is functioning. And it can be done in a way that is not completely blowing everything up. That's the case over here. Slaves often were in the Old Testament um, voluntary. Remember that their culture is so different. Sometimes they would run out of food and their crop was gone and they had no seed. And they were looking at truly the whole family starving to death because there's no help, there's no social programs, there's no food pantry, they're gonna die. And so they could, the, the man of the house could go to another man who maybe was quite wealthy and say, could I work for you in exchange for um, some food and some seed and things like that for my family? We're going to die. And the, and the wealthy man would hopefully say, sure. How many years do you want to do this? Well, if I give you three years, will you give me enough food to last a year? Sure, we'll do that. And so he's in, enslaved to him for three years. But he's thrilled because he's not going to die and his family's not going to die. And at the end of that three years, he is dismissed from slavery. He fulfilled his end of the bargain. You could not have a slave for more than seven years. He had to let them go. If a slave ran away, it indicates that something terrible happened to them or they wouldn't have been leaving. You could not return a slave who would run away. If you found a runaway slave, you could not take them back. If you kidnapped a slave, you died. If you bought a kidnapped slave, you too died. You got executed for that. So you can see in the Old Testament that the slavery thing is nothing like what we tend to think of. Then we have North American slavery, 1600s, 1700s, mid to, to mid 1800s. And that was abominable on so many levels. And I don't think I, I'm kind of running out of time. So I'm not going to really talk about that too much. I think we all know what, this, what the scenario was there. There is no condoning any of it. It was absolutely horrendous. Um, totally anti-biblical in every possible sense, had no correlation to anything happening in the Old Testament. But what about this time period that we're in right now with the slaves? What was that like? Was it more like the Old Testament? Was it more like the 1800s in, in America? What was that like? Well, about 30% of the population in the Roman Empire, they estimate, were slaves. So that's kind of a big portion. And it wasn't based on race. They would conquer various peoples, and then they would take people from the conquered you know, establishment, and they would make them slaves. And then the children born to any slave woman, regardless of who the dad was, was automatically a slave. And then there were other ways of becoming a slave. And there were also ways of getting out of slavery. It wasn't super easy, but it could happen. But here's why Paul did not say, don't have slaves. Masters, free your slaves. Slaves, you have every right to leave. You are free in Christ. You don't have to be a part of this. This is why he didn't do that. First of all, in this time period, in, in the book of Colossians, if a slave runs away and he's caught, they kill him. So if Paul were to say, hey, slaves, you don't need to be slaves anymore, or you can, you can revolt, um, they're going to die. So that would not be a compassionate thing for Paul to say to them. Here's the other thing. For slave owners, there were legal limits as to how many of your slaves you could let go if you felt like it. So even if you wanted to let them all go, you couldn't do it by law. You could only let a certain percentage go. And it was based on all kinds of different criteria. And because it's not a, a republic, it's not a democracy, 
there's not like you can go to, you know, protest this. You can't, you can't petition somebody to change the law. That's not how that worked at all. The law was the law. That's how it was. And Paul knew that if he said any of this stuff, like Christians should never, ever, ever have slaves to, to this audience, this particular audience at this time. We, we would say that to us today, by the way, but this is him speaking to this audience, that it would have been seen as a group that was leading a revolt and all the Christians would have been slaughtered. So this is why it appears as though, well, it looks like the Bible is condoning slavery, but it's not condoning it. It is instructing these people how to live with the reality of the time period and what is going on. So that should help us feel much better about that passage. By the way, chapter four is going to deal with the masters. Why they put a chapter demarcation break between the end of three and the beginning of four when they obviously have to go together. It's kind of like that husband wife thing. I am really interested to know the person who did that, what their thinking was, because that should never have happened. By the way, the, the chapters were not part of the original text. Those were added later. The verse numbers were added later to help us kind of catalog things and stay together. So that's not inspired. Um, that's just imposed on the text. And I don't understand why they split it up. But anyway, just things that make you go, hmm. Um, let's go on to verses 23 to 24. Still speaking to the slaves, okay? Still in that. So now you kind of can get a, a sense of, who these people were and what their lives were like. He says to the slaves, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving, not your master, but the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like what we said last week. Jesus isn't first in my life. He is my life. So when I'm doing all of the things I do, I'm doing it for him ultimately. And then those under him in my purview get blessed by that. Verse 25, for the wrongdoer will be paid back. The wrongdoer, the master, uh, will be paid back for the wrong he has done. And there is no partiality. So back up to, to this other verse, the inheritance. I, this is just so sweet. Here's what he's saying. Hey, slaves, we know that you get mistreated a lot. We know that you have no hope of ever having an inheritance. You're not going to get anything. But when your master dies, he doesn't leave anything to you. You have nothing and no hope of ever having anything. But guess what? Paul says you do have an inheritance. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, even if you're a slave, guess what? Your inheritance is even better than any earthly inheritance could ever be because yours is going to be in eternity. Your reward comes not from your master, but from Jesus Christ. And then when he talks about this wrongdoer, he's saying, listen, guys, I know it's so hard to be mistreated. It is so hard when you are working full out and they're beating you or they're excoriating you or they're accusing you of things and then punishing you for the things that you didn't do. But listen, God will deal the retribution and there is no partiality, which means no longer is it, well, he's a master, so he gets to do what he wants. Uh-uh, not before God. There's no partiality. He's just a person. He is no different than you or anybody else. <laughs> when it comes to God, we are all on such level ground as sinners. We are either on level ground at the foot of the cross as forgiven, or we are on level ground in front of the judgment where he's going to deal out his wrath. It doesn't matter how famous you are how much money you have, what kind of pedigree you hold, how many degrees you have. None of that makes any difference to God at all. We are all even. But where it's beautiful is back to where we started in the body of Christ, where we have all these different people and we all look different and we all come from different backgrounds and we can be one in Christ and treat each other in the same way that Christ sees us, which is all equals. That in a marriage, even though, yes, God has put the husband in that headship role and the wife is to submit to that. It's not because she's not good enough. It's not because she's weak. It's because God has done that for her protection. He is her covering in that marriage. And it is a beautiful thing in equality to serve each other in that way. And then the children under that, 
to be able to obey their parents because that's what Jesus wants them to do. And ultimately they do it for him and the parents are blessed. This is, this is Christianity. This is it. We don't get to see it too much because we're so marred by sin. But when you can get a group of people, a family unit, a church unit who operates based on what we just read tonight, if you could just do that, nothing else, just that, the world watching on would sit back with their jaw on the ground and go, how is this happening? How are you doing this? Why are you doing this? How can I have that? That's being salt and light to a world looking on that desperately needs Christ and totally is not interested in us beating them to death with the Bible. But they're watching our lives. They're listening to the words that come out of our mouth. And hopefully, hopefully, we will live in such a way that when we do speak words of truth to them from the word of God, when we do share the gospel, they are receiving it because they go, whatever you have is for real. And I want that for my life too. And that's how it's supposed to work. Well, next week, like I said, chapter four, we're going to go to God's word to masters um, because he's not stopping here, just um, just with the slaves. Um Next week is Valentine's Day 2022, and we're going to go ahead and do Bible study at 9 p.m. Eastern time like we always do. If you're tied up for Valentine's Day, have a wonderful time. I hope you get chocolate and flowers, massages, if you have something else, chocolate flowers. Um, we we're doing a fun thing before we got going here at 9 p.m., so comments were cracking me up, all the things that you guys want. If you would like to be part of our Facebook group, that's the address for it. It is Bible Hub, not Bible Study Hub, because... Bible Study Hub was already taken when I went to get the name. So it's just Bible Hub on Facebook. But we'd love to have you be part of our Facebook group. Best Facebook group on Facebook by a long shot. And if you ever want to just listen to some videos that you've missed, kind of catch up, the easiest place to do that is on our YouTube channel because they're all nice and neat and in order and a little bit edited. So they're a little bit fun. All right. Um, thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight. You've been amazing. And I cannot wait to be with you. Hey, maybe we'll finish Colossians next week. Wouldn't that be nice? And then we'll be in the book of Genesis. Can't wait. All right. I love you all. Have a wonderful week.